Welcome to the Osho Public Library's Local History Spotlight. My name is Nicole Adams, and um, I'm the Genealogy and Local History Librarian for the Osho Public Libraries. Uh, we're thrilled this evening to have uh, Dan Buchanan, whose new book, The Wreck of the HMS Speedy, A Tragedy That Shook Upper Canada, will be um, coming out on August 18th. Um, Dan is a genealogist and historian and is well known uh, as the history guy. Uh, for his passionate uh, involvement in many organizations and projects related to Oshawa's history and heritage. Um, he has written a, num a couple of other books, uh, which we have in our library collection, one of which is Murder in the Family, The Dr. King Story, as well as 38 Hours to Montreal. Um, Dan is an engaging storyteller and is also uh, the host of history videos and uh, creator of a massive genealogy website called Trees by Dan, which is used by many people in helping with their uh, own family history. He lives in Brighton and is focused on research into local and Ontario history and in finding imaginative ways to bring our past to life. We're very excited to have him uh, here this evening to talk about his research into the wreck of the HMS Speedy, uh, which sank in 1804 off Presqu'île Point. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so you can put your questions in the chat box and then I'll ask those of Dan near the end of the session. Um, mentioned it will be being recorded. So I'll turn this over to Dan Buchanan now. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I assume everyone can hear me okay. Some of you from Brighton. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for connecting. Uh, I'm delighted to be connected to the local history spotlight, the Oshawa Public Library, in a virtual sense, of course. Now, except for the fact that it was a great commute, rather be standing in front of you in your lovely library and under the circumstances this is the best thing we can do so with lots of help from Nicole and getting through the problems we're all learning about this uh, let's do it the story of HMS Speedy has always been part of my life I grew up on a farm north of Brighton and in that area the story of the Speedy is part of the heritage landscape now, with the publication of my third book, The Wreck of HMS 80, the tragedy that shook up for Canada, my interest in the speedy story has come full circle. And you will see that on, on the screen, um, um, August 18th is when the book's coming out. Then there's the question of why now? Why did I write this book at this time? Well, the answer to that is here. In the fall of 2018, I received a phone call from Kirsten Musclo of Belleville. Uh, Kirsten had been for more than two decades a companion and associate for Mr. Ed Burt in Belleville, the diver who searched for the Speedy out in Lake Ontario in the early 1990s. Um, sadly, Ed passed away in the fall of 2017. And a year later, Kirsten was looking to move on. She was also in a big hurry, because the next question was, will you be home this afternoon? And I said, yes, and a couple hours later, lock on my door, and this box of documents was put on my desk. I stammered about how long it was going to take me to get through these documents, and she looked me in the eye, and she said, oh, you keep them. And then she left. So at that moment, I knew that my third book would be about the speedy. Why are we talking about the Speedy? Let's look at the events that led up to the loss of the Speedy. This rough sketch of Lake Ontario uh, shows with the arrows the various locations that will be mentioned in the story. Starting out with the Farewell Trading Post on Lake Scugog, uh, Town of York, uh, which is now Toronto, Fort George, there at the mouth of the Niagara River, Oak Orchard Creek here along the south shore of Lake Ontario, Smith's Creek, which is now Fort Hope, uh, Dean's Creek, right to the east of there, and of course, over at Newcastle, or at Peskiel Point, the town of Newcastle. Now, the story begins over at the fur trading post on Lake Scugog. Now, since I'm talking to a group of folks from around Oshawa, I'm going to mention briefly the issue of the exact location of the farewell trading post. Some documents say that it was on Washburn Island. 
and some documents say that it was on Ball Point. When you read my book, you will see that I have not mentioned these names at all, and that was very deliberate. Think back to 1804. These names wouldn't be used at all for decades. In fact, Mississauga people lived here at that time, so there were, if there were any names associated with these landforms, they would be indigenous names. Also, uh, my editors told me in no uncertain terms that this issue was not part of the speedy story, so it was edited out of the book at an early stage. Having said that, I'm gonna, I will tell you that I did a detailed analysis of this question, mostly out of curiosity, and when my book is released on August 18th, my website will have a section for extra information where you can download all the details of that analysis. But just spoken briefly, I will say that most documents say ballpoint. The earliest documents say ballpoint. And to me, the most important document being the obituary of Murray Farewell also says ballpoint. So I will take that providence uh, any day. And, uh, and if you want to discuss that, you can ask questions at the end of the presentation. Well, the training post was established there on the, in the northeast reaches of Lake Scugog in 1802 by Jacob and Lawrence Herkimer. They were brothers who worked as fur traders and merchants with the Northwest Company in Montreal. In 1804, the training post was in charge of another set of brothers, William and Moody Farewell. They would take routine trips up into the North Country to collect furs from the indigenous people that lived up there and bring them back down to the post. When they were on their trips, they left John Sharp, an ex-British soldier, in charge of the trading post. He was to look after the pace and do any trading with the Mississauga people that uh, might come around. In May of 1804, the Farewell brothers returned from one such trip and found John Sharp murdered. They buried their associate best they could, and the next morning paddled south with their canoes full of furs across Lake Scugog, uh, landed in the area of Caesarea today, and made a deal with the Mississauga people there to carry the furs down to the lakeshore. This was the northern terminus of the eastern branch of the Scugog carrying place, an ancient trail that the indigenous people used to travel between the interior and the lakeshore. And then the Farewell brothers hoisted a canoe on their shoulders and started walking south. Then they veered west and eventually came into Whitby Township. This map is from Grant Carsich's book, The Scugog Carrying Place, and it shows this thin line is the eastern branch of the Scugog Carrying Place. It goes south along the west side of, the, of Harmony Creek. And second concession, there's a branch where another branch goes up to the west. And it came down to the shore in the area of the earliest settlers in this area, mainly Benjamin Wilson. When the brothers got to the shore, uh, a neighbor of the Wilsons, Elizir Lockwood, told them that he had overheard a Mississauga man bragging about how he had bashed in the head of this British trader. The man's name was Agatonicut, and he was very proud of the fact that he'd gained restitution for his family for the death of his brother, Whistling Duck, who was killed by a white settler a year before. So there was no mystery about the murder of John Sharp. Now the Mississauga people had established themselves in their traditional um, camp there at the mouth of Annis Creek, later Oshawa Creek. They had extensive fishing weirs there, had been for generations. Their chief, Wabakishiko, was very concerned about this turn of events. He understood the danger to his people. He could see red-coated soldiers coming into the camp with rifles. So he knew that he had to take Agatonica to York and turn him over to the authorities. So the next morning, he led his people in their canoes down the shoreline of Lake Ontario to um, York. Well, the next day, Elizir Lockwood and Moody Farewell got in their canoe and headed down the shore of Lake Ontario towards York. Their intention was to report the murder of John Sharp to the authorities at York. When they got to York, they went right to Parliament House, as you see here. 
and they reported their story to Chief Justice Henry Alcock. Now, when the details of the Sharp murder were revealed, the Lieutenant Governor, Peter Hunter, agreed with the Chief Justice that this was a very serious problem. They ordered that Agatonica be arrested and put in jail right away. Moody Farewell and Elzer Lockwood would have gone over with a squad of soldiers to identify Agatonica over on Gibraltar Point where the Mississauga people were camped. And then he was brought back over to York. Chief Abakishiko, managing the process, made sure that there was no resistance. Well, the prisoner was taken to the home district jail, which you see here. This was located on the south side of King Street in York. Uh, today, you could say it's just a little west of where St. James Cathedral is in downtown Toronto on King Street today. Well, as the prisoner was being established and secured in jail, the authorities kind of considered their dilemma. They were worried that a murder trial held at York would ultimately mean the hanging of a Mississauga man at the home district jail with all of his family camped over there at Gibraltar Point. Now, there have been many alarms through the years of suggesting that the indigenous people of Upper Canada were ready to rise up and massacre all the whites. The British settlers, of course, still held a very exaggerated view of indigenous people, you know, considering them to be violent and volatile, even though there had been very little violence in the previous years. It was just conventional wisdom based on racial prejudice. Well, on a strategic level, the authorities at York needed to maintain a very delicate balance. On the one hand, they wanted more settlers to come in to Upper Canada to create a good level of resistance to the next American attack. They knew they were going to attack at some point, just didn't know when. At the same time, the British also knew that they would need the help of indigenous warriors in order to counter the American attack. As a result, boatloads of food and clothing and tools and weapons went across Lake Ontario and were distributed to the indigenous camps, all to maintain good relations with their indigenous allies. So for the people in power at York, local incidents like the murder of John Sharp would not be allowed to interfere with the broader strategy. Well, the key question then was how to avoid a hanging at York. Well, Chief Justice Alcock recommended they deal with this by highlighting a law that said a murder trial must be held in the courthouse of the district where the murder took place. Problem was, they didn't know exactly which district the murder, the farewell trading post was in. Now, just two years before, in 1802, Home District, which used to spread from west of Toronto all the way to the Trent River, was divided and Newcastle District was created. And the boundary between the two was from around Oshawa up through Lake Scugog. But that boundary had only been surveyed to the first couple of concessions to support the new settlers coming in. So in technical terms, they could not say the location of the Farewell Trading Post relative to this border. So there would need to be a survey well, the survey was conducted by John Sharp, sorry, by John Stegman. He was one of the most experienced deputy surveyors in Upper Canada at this time. And he, um, I don't know what that is. The exact, he, his report said very clearly, the exact and positive situation of the House of Murray Farewell is seven miles eastward of the division line between the township of Whitby and Darlington, which is that border between Holm and Newcastle District. Well, the Chief Justice would have been happy with this result. It meant that the trial of Agatonicut would be held at the new town of Newcastle, way down there at Preskill Point, and not at York. So mission accomplished. Come on. Well, at the end of September, HMS Speedy was the only ship that was docked there at York. So the captain, Lieutenant Thomas Paxton, was given orders to prepare to sail to Newcastle. Captain Paxton was appalled at his orders. It was October, it was outside safe sailing season, and his ship was in terrible shape. It had been a very difficult season. And 
he was very concerned that he had to be responsible for 20 people going to Newcastle. He refused to sail. Well, the Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Hunter, wasn't really amused at this, so he simply threatened him with court-martial. Sail to Newcastle or go to jail, that was the choice. So with his wife and children in mind, Captain Paxson relented and agreed to sail, although he wouldn't be happy about it. HMS Speedy, which you see represented here in Snyder's image of the Speedy, was six years old, so near the end of its expected life span at this point. And it, as I mentioned, it had been a very difficult sailing season. The weather that season had been exceptionally wet and stormy. A major refit and repair was already on the books for the Speedy and its sister ship, the Swift, once they got back to Kingston at the end of the season. Ships that were built by the Provincial Marine at that time were consistently constructed with green, uncured pine timber so that they rotted right away very routinely and every winter there had to be a major refit just to keep them on the lake for the next season. Then on October 5th, the Speedy sailed down the bay a little way to the east to a spot about 200 yards off from Parliament House. And it stopped in front of what they called the landing place. This was a gravelly beach um, that was near a break in the bank that was along the shore at the foot of Frederick Street. It was very convenient for the people who lived in York to bring their baggage and come down here and then ferry across to the boat in rowboats and bateau. It was also convenient for those at the home district jail to march the prisoner over to the ship and uh, to the landing place and onto the ship. Then a few days later on Sunday, October the 7th, it was later in the morning, the passengers began to arrive at the landing place and started to be ferried over to the ship. The highest ranking person to board the Speedy that day would be the Solicitor General of Upper Canada, Robert Isaac de Grey. He was a single man about age 32, and he would be accompanied by his servant, Simon Baker. Now, Simon was a member of a slave family that had been in the family of Robert Gray for several generations. And Robert Gray, before he sailed on the Speedy, wrote a new will, which stipulated that all of Simon's family would be freed in the case of his death. Robert Gray also had a legal assistant with him, 20-year-old John Anderson, who was a law student at York, and also a cousin. Also uh, boarding the Speedy was Thomas Cochran. At 27, he was very young to be a judge on the Court of King's Bench for Upper Canada, but he would be the presiding judge at the trial of Agatonica. John Fisk was the high constable of Home District, and therefore he was responsible for the security and the condition of the prisoner. James Ruggles was a magistrate and the justice of the peace of York, and he would travel in support of John Fisk. Angus McNeil was a lawyer and would act as counsel for the defense at the trial. John Stegman, the deputy survey, was there to testify at the trial, and George Cowan would act as the interpreter. He was an agent for the Indian Department. Rounding out the list was Jacob Herkimer, a merchant and trader, one of the two brothers who owned the uh, farewell trading post, and he would also visit friends in Kingston and family after the trial. Also on board, of course, was Lieutenant Thomas Paxson, the captain of the Speedy, uh, who was managing the loading of passengers and cargo. Uh, there would have been several soldiers on board to uh, guard Augatonica, as well as the crew, uh, probably made up about 20 people altogether. There is a report that HMS Speedy ran aground before getting outside the bay. Now, there was no damage. It's all just sand spit, a, a sandy uh, bars along there. So Captain Paxson was able to disembark a few hours later. But this delay would have serious consequences. It usually took about 24 hours, a little more, to sail from York to Newcastle. So now with this delay, Speedy wouldn't arrive at Newcastle till well late in the afternoon into the evening. It was October, so it would be dark. 
Now, Captain Paxton would grumble about this, but he proceeded to take Speedy out into the lake with a westerly breeze, directed the Speedy to be taken out about a mile offshore, which was common practice at that time. They sailed through the night, the weather held, beautiful sunrise arising in the morning in the east. But then during the morning of the 8th, the weather picked up. The wind picked up and clouds filled the sky. And by later in the afternoon, the rain started to fall and the wind picked up even more. So people were huddling on blankets on the deck against the rain and Captain Paxton would start to get worried. Moody, Farewell and Elzer Lockwood were at the same time paddling towards Newcastle. They would uh, testify at the trial of Agatonica. So late on the 8th, they passed Smith's Creek, which is today the Ganaraska River there at Port Hope. And they went a little farther and then beached their canoes at the mouth of Dean's Creek. Now, one account of the Speedy story says that while they were setting up camp there at the mouth of Dean's Creek, Moody Farewell looked out into the lake and just for a brief moment saw the Speedy. Well, today, Dean's Creek is actually Gages Creek, and we can see that it runs under number two highway there just east of Port Hope. So in the evening of Monday, October 8th, HMS Speedy was sailing closer and closer to Newcastle, pushed hard by a westerly storm. Then at some point later in the evening, a nor'easter hit the area. Now this was a vicious storm, comes out of the northeast and blows towards the north northwest, high winds, sleet and snow and hail. It lasted for two days. The Speedy was not seen again. The folks around Newcastle spent several days afterwards scouring the shoreline in all directions, trying to find even uh, a mention of the Speedy, anything. They didn't find a stick of wood, nothing. On October 15th, a letter from Kingston to York said, the Speedy's non-arrival prevents my sending the pay list for Ryerson to sign. This was eight days after HMS Speedy had sailed. Now this is a practical and mundane matter, but it demonstrates that the people at Kingston were concerned that the Speedy had not arrived as expected. Then on the 19th, Lieutenant Colonel John Vincent, commander of the Fort, down, Fort George down here at the Ni mouth of Niagara River, wrote a letter to York saying that he'd heard a report that material from a ship had been sighted 40 miles east of there on the shore of the south side of Lake Ontario at a place called Oak Orchard Creek. Then six days later on the 25th, a confirming letter arrived, leaving no doubt. It included the final evidence saying, the name of Paxton was on the lantern of the binnacle. This was the only report of any physical remains of the Speedy ever being found. So let's fast forward to the modern age. This is Ed Burt. Ed grew up in Belleville. He loved diving from an early age, got an engineering degree at Carleton in Ottawa, and he formed two enterprises. One was a metal foundry, which specialized in marine products, and the other was an underwater salvage and exploration company called Ocean Scan Systems. Now, the jobs that Ocean Scan Systems would undertake were varied, but they included things like finding a small aircraft that had crashed in a northern Ontario lake, or nasty work sometimes, like pulling bodies out of a submerged automobile. They would often work with the law enforcement agencies, the OPP, the RCMP, and the Coast Guard, and they often trained divers from those institutions while there was a lot of demand for this kind of expertise. In the summer of 1989, Edbert was conducting training for OPP divers southeast of Presque Isle Point. They were over the shallowest point of a large underwater plateau called Dobbs Bank. A diver comes up with a coin, hands it to Ed. Ed looked at it and saw, well, 
immediately he could see this was a very old vintage. He could see the date, 1732, on it, and the wording was in Spanish. This was a piece of eight. Well, Ed was intrigued, to say the least. Only a few weeks later, Ed and his crew were again out over Dobbs Bank. This time they were testing a new model of ROV underwater camera. They would drag the camera in the water and it would take pictures of the ground and have it recorded on a VHS tape. Well, that night at home, Ed reviewed the VHS tape just out of curiosity. He was amazed at what he saw because he believed he was seeing many different items that looked like they were pieces from an old shipwreck. Well, certainly with this video and the coin, Ed Burke was on the path towards exploration. This image is the first screen of a promotional video that Ed created, which includes that 1989 video uh, under Do on Dobbs Bank. And that a VHS tape was included in the box of documents that ended up on my table in the fall of 2018. And I have since digitized that for easier handling. In order to get started, Ed contacted a professional marine archaeologist that he knew. And after viewing the tape, um, the archaeologist agreed, yes, there was enough information here to warrant further ex exploration. A, a license for marine archaeology survey work was put in place, and arrangements were made for some funding. Ed also created the HMS Feedy Foundation, which was a nonprofit corporation designed to promote the Speedy Project and possibly to do some fundraising. Initially, bad weather kept them off the lake. So they, their first day of survey work was not till June 16th. And they began to follow the grid system that had been laid out by the archeologists. Now, no location information had been included in that training video from the year before. And this was a very large area. So it would be a matter of eliminating one grid square after another until they found what they were looking for. This picture was taken on July 26, and it shows uh, Glen Rover, the boat that was used in the 1990 survey work. This is Ed Burt sitting on Avon, the inflatable raft, which was used as a diving platform. The chief diver in Ed's crew was Terry Coons seen here with a scorching sunburn. He was a very experienced diver, having gained most of his, his uh, training with the U.S. Navy. I had a long talk with Terry about his experiences working with Ed on the Speedy Project. He said that that first year, there were several weeks of beautiful weather. So they were out on the lake day after day after day. He said he lost 50 pounds doing so much diving. Basically, what they would do is run the ROV camera over the ground in the water, and if they saw something coming up on the monitor that was interesting, they would stop the boat. Terry would don his equipment, take the big 35 millimeter underwater camera, go down and take pictures of it. Well, through the diving season of 1990, they, the survey work continued, but they failed to find the items that had been seen in the 1989 video. Then, late in October, they hit the mother load. They moved to one grid square, and that revealed a lot of items scattered widely. And they spent the, two, the last two days of that season just documenting all the items that they were seeing in that grid square. Well, there was great elation, obviously, after a seemingly unproductive summer of hard work. In hindsight, Ed would later say, well, he would grumble, that they had been on the adjoining square back in July. They just didn't know how close they were to what they were looking for. Here's a very important point. The archaeological survey license for 1990 was applied for and given to a professional marine archaeologist. And the pertinent phrase in that license is as follows. The licensee agrees to retrieve only a limited number of artifacts sufficient to establishing full and proper identification of the wreck. Well, 
unfortunately, in the 1990 season, they hadn't come across items until late in the season, and then they only had time to document, so there was no opportunity to use this phrase. Then in the spring of 1991, the marine archaeologists decided not to return to the Speedy Project. Now, he identified the items that had been found late in the season and says, well, there's good reason to continue. And if you find anything that identifies this, re these remains as the Speedy, I'll be glad to come back and help. But otherwise, he had other major projects that needed his attention. The result of this change meant that the survey license for 1991 was applied for and given to Ed Burke, who was not a professional marine archaeologist. As a result of that, the pertinent phrase in this license reads, retrieval of artifacts from underwater sites is not covered under this license. In effect, even for the items that they had found the previous fall, they were not able to go down there and retrieve them to try to identify whether it was the speedy. And even subsequent licenses would start to use the phrase, do not disturb, which means hands off everything. Well, this situation was very annoying for Ed Burt. Now they'd actually found artifacts, but they couldn't bring them up for investigation. And if they couldn't bring artifacts up for investigation, then they couldn't even start to think it might be from the Speedy. And if the marine archaeologists weren't seeing that it was likely from the Speedy, they were unlikely to be involved. And therefore, the Speedy, the marine, the artifacts wouldn't be identified from the Speedy. It was just a classic catch-22 situation. So what did they find? They found a debris field. No, it's not a sunken ship like we see in National Geographic or, you know, recreational diving magazines. This was a lot of small items scattered widely, sometimes in clusters. Anything that was wooden was broken and jagged. This image was one of the most uh, celebrated of the images from the 1989 video. It shows a pair of spectacles, a clay pipe, a cannonball, and a glass bottle, that typical dark glass that they used in those days still with the cork in it. The professional marine archaeologists who were involved in the Speedy Project looked at this image and said, these things are from that early 1800s period. That raised some excitement uh, about the project. Some of the most easily identifiable items were the masts. Speedy was a twin mast schooner. Now, when the divers first saw this and when it was seen in the video, they thought these might just be logs. But when they looked closer, they saw that, first of all, they were fairly close together. Second, they were absolutely identical and they were manufactured. You can see the one here has tapering at the end. And the dimensions of these masts matched exactly with the documentation we have from the Kingston shipyard for ships that were built in that late 1790s period. Now, it's also interesting to note that in the uh, historical records that have been accumulated over the years, information about the final resting place for all the ships that were on Lake Ontario in 1804, and there was only a few, five or six, all except for the Speedy. The Speedy is the only ship that isn't accounted for in those historical records. This was a gunboat, so there would be cannon and cannonballs. On the left here is one of the several cannonballs that were identified in the debris field. On the right is a foggy picture, but the outline is clear of a small cannon. Terry Coons said he stood over this several times, and he said he was very intrigued by the fact that there was a raised area. You can just make out there's kind of a circle here. It was kind of a, like a crest. And he really wondered if he scraped the moss off the crest area, if he'd see any identifying information. Do not disturb. He was not able to do that because of the rules in the license. It often spoke about the ship's bell. This is the best picture we have of the bell from the 1989 video. Terry Coons again stood over this. He said it's very clearly the ship's, a ship's bell. 
Uh, there, you could see the ring at the one end. It was covered in very thick moss. This place in particular, he said, he stood over and wondered if he just took his knife out and swiped the moss off the bell, if he could see the name HS, oh, I'm sorry, if he could see the name HMS Speedy on the bell. It was common. They engraved the name of the ship on the ship's bell. Again, do not disturb. So he wasn't able to do that. And he wonders about it to this day. Another mystery that remains is whatever happened to all those 35 millimeter pictures that Terry Coons took. He told me he took hundreds of them. And I asked him where they might be. He said, well, Ed had them. Nobody knows where they are. There, there's a good mystery to solve. They were not in the collection that ended up on my table in the fall of 2018. Well, after the third season of survey work, the end of the 1992 season, funding ran out, and Ed Bird had to get back to, well, revenue generating business. In fact, the Speedy project had been a money pit. Ed used the, H, uh, the HMS Speedy Foundation to promote the project, raise awareness in the community. He did speaking engagements and newspaper articles, uh, even did t-shirts and a badge, as you see here. Ed also developed the idea that a marine museum should be built, preferably on Presqu'il Point, as far as he was concerned, to house all these items that should be brought up from the Speedy site. Unfortunately, nobody was interested in a marine museum, and the regulations with the ministry at that time would just never allow anything like that to happen. But Ed persisted in promoting that idea. Ed continually applied for survey licenses for the Speedy site, even well after 1992 when he wasn't doing any survey work. Now, it was no secret that Ed hated doing reporting to the ministry. So it's not a surprise either to see that by 2005, he was so far behind with his annual reporting to the ministry that they finally put their foot down. They said you would get no new licenses unless you at least attempt to comply, to bring yourself up into compliance of the reporting regulations. So in order to get new licenses, Ed was compelled to complete the 1997 project report. 2005, no survey work since 1992, so Ed was doing the 1997 project report. Well, in his own contrarian way, Ed would use this opportunity to provide a full-throated version of what he believed had happened to the Speedy. He'd been leaning up to this for a long time, and it all came cascading out in the 1997 project report. 120 pages many very detailed technical descriptions of elements that he felt were necessary in the story. All of his pictures, charts and maps to support his ideas, it was a major production. The most important page of that report is this chart, which shows an estimated route that the Speedy may have taken, shown in the dark blue line. According to the way Ed told the story, <clears throat> The speed of his sailing from the west couldn't make the turn into Presqu'il Point, sailed off into Weller's Bay. There were no sand spits along the edge of Weller's Bay at that time. It was a great place to ride out a storm. Then the nor'easter hit, blew the speedy back out into the lake. The dramatic climax of the story is when HM Speedy collides with a rock a few inches below the surface of the water, there on that shallowest point of Dobbs Bank. It was a violent collision. The way the ship, the condition the ship was in, it just broke apart. Pieces of the decking in the hull went this way, the mast toppled over, people and cargo all went into the water. 20 people on board wouldn't have had a chance, probably died in the collision or a few minutes afterwards as the ship disintegrated around them. All of those pieces, Going again with the wind and the waves would eventually settle down in the water there south of Dobbs Bank, finding their resting place for the next two centuries. 
This was the story that Ed Burt believed in 2005 and would promote till his death in 2017. Of course, much of the detail in this story might be described as speculation. Ed Burt was an engineer, and he knew what he had seen on the bottom of the, of the lake out there on Dobbs Bank. And he felt that he needed to generate a compelling, dramatic story that would explain all the situations and circumstances that the Speedy went through in order to have the remains of the ship end up in that place, in that condition. You could call it reverse engineering. In 2012, Ed Burt refreshed the HMS Speedy Foundation with some new faces. I joined at that time as historian from Brighton. I was interested to learn more about the story and was interested to talk directly to Ed Burt to find out what the status of the project was. But well, we had meetings and did some promotional projects. Uh, we did speaking engagements. Sometimes we went separately. Sometimes we went together like this one at the Brighton Provost Club in March of 2014. One of the most enjoyable projects we undertook was this storyboard, which we put up at the Interpretive Center at Presque Isle Point. Um, I developed the content and Phil Spencer, another member of the group, built the frame and we did the installation together. Had a lot of support from the um, friends of Presque Isle Park who operate the Interpretive Center. Of course, this goes along with the dramatic video that's been there in Interpretive Center for a number of years. And of course, the uh, historical plaque that's over there at the shoreline. So the speedy story is well represented at Presque Isle Point. However, the mystery remains. Are those items that Ed Burt saw on the bottom of the lake there over Dobbs Bank actually remains of the Speedy? Well, the correct answer for that today is we don't know. Well, of course, Ed Burt would always tell us that he was 99.99% .99 sure he had found the remains of the Speedy, and he believed that until the day he died. Bottom line is that all of these artifacts require the attention of professional marine archaeologists to go down there and investigate with the proper scientific methods. Professional marine archaeologists must jump in the water and go down and see these items in situ, take beautiful new pictures with modern technology. While Marine archaeologists were involved in the Speedy Project in the 1990s. Not one of them dived in the water and saw any of these artifacts. Without direct engagement from the professionals, this mystery will remain. Does it matter? Really, does it matter? Well, as a historian, I can tell you that I don't think it matters all that much. Sure, it would be great to have, you know, another piece of the broad mosaic of Canadian history removed if we can eliminate this mystery. I'd be one of the happiest guys around if that could be accomplished. However, in the meantime, the story of HMS Speedy is a rich and fascinating part of Canadian history. Without pieces of wood or metal in a museum, it's still part of our heritage. And I'm good with that. So we'll continue to tell the story, learn what we can from it. I hope you enjoy the new book, The Wreck of the HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Upper Canada. Its release date is August 18th. It'll be available in all the bookstores. And I have to tell you, I kind of grin when I say this, the largest bookstore in Canada, Indigo, loves this book. And it's going to be distributed across the country and with lots of merchandising in store and online. At the same time, I always suggest support your local bookstores. They're struggling these days like everyone else. If you have any questions, look at my website, Dan Buchanan History Guy, uh, for information about the release of the book. And I have a, an events page there that shows where I'm speaking. It's going to be all virtual now. Um, as well as after August 18, that section for extra information with lots of downloads for you to see some of my research. Well, thanks very much, folks. That uh, is the story, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, 
Um, so if anybody would like, they can choose to unmute themselves. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Dan a question, you're welcome to do so. Um, or you can follow up with him. There's his website there. Um, and I'm sure uh, we'd love to see, there'll be copies of the book available through our public library, which you can request um, once physical copies are available. <laughs> And um, I'd like to thank Dan so much for joining us today. So if there's no questions, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Oh, here we go. What did Speedy, um, what had the Speedy done before its last voyage? So I assume maybe what it was used for or? Um... Yeah. There is a lot of information about what these ships were doing day in and day out. The um, uh, British military records have, uh, it's on the Canadian uh, archives, have thousands of letters and documents about what was going on at the, at the shipyards in Kingston, uh, who was uh, sailing, who the captains were, um, what they were, car cargo they were taking. It's, it's really well documented. Uh, and the Speedy was just one of those, regular. I, I call it a, a government taxi. It was really mundane stuff. Um, it's, it has examples of them taking a load of peas that was to go eventually over to, to Fort Frederick, uh, Fort George. The, uh, uh, it would take rum sometimes. It would take corn. It would take all sorts of stuff, primarily cargo, but also along with those sailings, there would be government officials and uh, merchants going back and forth as they needed to go. So it had a kind of a dual role. And there were probably three or four ships like that um, at the same time. There were never enough of them. So it was very mundane, very tough uh, in terms of keeping the ship in good shape. Um, so and the Speedy, I don't think, was in any worse shape than any of the others. It was older than some, but, um, you know, it was, it was in bad shape for good reason, put it that way. <laughs> Um, another question we have is, uh, given that Ontario had plenty of wood, why didn't they season it? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think it had to do with the operation of the provincial marine from an administrative standpoint. Um, the provincial marine was, well, you could kind of say it's the British Navy on the Great Lakes, but it was actually administered by the British Army. So you had army officers making decisions about ships. Uh, it was a very difficult conflict because they wouldn't listen, listen to what the experienced captains like Thomas Paxton had to say um, about a lot of issues. Uh, push come to shove, it was always the guy with the highest rank who made the decision. For example, before the Speedy and the Swift went off the blocks at Kingston in the fall of 1798, quick decision came from the authority above that they needed to add two and a half feet to the deck, to the height of the deck, because they wanted to be able to carry more cargo so they could generate more fees because they charged people for this. And as a result, you had a, set, a couple of ships that were clumsy in bad weather. It, it just threw the whole ship off center in terms of equilibrium. Uh, and those who are familiar with sailing, I'm not, would know what that means. Uh, just um, the practice of building a ship very quickly when it was ordered without waiting a year and a half for timber to be cured was not really changed until up in the War of 1812. Uh, it, this was still really early in the development and it was just not considered necessary. Um, and whether they even had ship, uh, shipwrights who were experienced enough to do it was another question. Um, so yeah, I, there's a lot of, uh, I think, conditions at the time with the Provincial Marine and how it was run that led to that really bad habit that seems to us to be really silly, but it was just part of the times. Great. Thank you, Dan. If, I'm, I can't wait to, to read about the, the sort of the mystery behind it and that it's kind of frustrating to think that so close, but yet so far, right? They couldn't touch, they couldn't disturb. Um, and, and one would hope that eventually um, they'd be given sort of a limited license to examine certain materials that might identify the ship definitively. Well, that of course is one of the main questions here that's kind of the elephant in the room. 
and that is why wasn't Edbert successful in doing anything further after the survey work? Um, he promoted his ideas for years till he died, but nothing further happened. There was no other exploration work done on the site after that. Um, and, you know, you can attribute it, I think, primarily to the character of Ed Burt. Um, he was a curmudgeon. I mean, he could be a very nasty fellow. Uh, he hated anybody who carried a briefcase uh, and he, anybody who was a professional. He was not going to listen to anybody who would tell him what to do. All those young people that had their degrees telling him what to do, uh-uh. He just wouldn't accept that. It was kind of that, that old salt arrogance that just turned people away. And as a result, the ministry and the Ontario government who managed this just wrote him off and just almost wouldn't believe him. Um, and if you talk to people around Belleville, you, you will come across examples of, well, somebody, you talk to them, they'll say, oh, yeah, Edward, he was a neat guy. Other people will say, don't even mention that name. <laughs> so I think it was largely because of Edward. Um, I think it's also because the approach to marine archaeology really dramatically changed all around the world, really, in those last two decades of the 1900s and certainly that uh, further into the 2000s. It was really a matter of there got to be so much cost and liability involved in the government being involved in these kind of underwater sites that they just set up the rules to ostensibly protect the sites, and they did because there was a lot of examples of sites being pillaged, uh, but it was really designed mostly to keep people away from them, uh, including the, the folks who wanted to dive on. And there's, there's been archeology span in various sites, but no, nobody's taken a shot at this one. Uh, I think it's too difficult. It's out in the lake. It's a very difficult spot. Um, that, that was very clear from what Terry Coons told me about how rough it was out there you're really out in the middle of the lake. You've got deep water all around you, except on that Dobbs Bank area. Um, and uh, he was, they tended not to be very complimentary about the diving skills of the professional guys. Uh, but these two fellas had been through the mill over the years, so they were not phased at all going out in rough water and diving all day. It was just not a big deal for them. So that was lots of reasons. Anyway, I, I just wanted to, you know, try to let people know, you know, here's what happened back there in the 90s. And, you know, you can make up your mind yourself about whether you think it's the speedy or not. But um, I don't think it can be discounted out of hand. Uh, I think there's further work to do there if anyone ever wants to deal with it. Well, another comment we had in the chat was that um, under there's new undersea um, ROVs that could get uh, excellent photos. So may, perhaps that could be done, like, you know, uh, new technology being used so that you can still be um, preserving the site, but get more high quality images than you could have gotten from 1989 or 1990. I have to say that on that topic, uh, when the, I was together with the group there in 2012, 13, 14, um, we kept telling Ed that we would not go any farther than a certain point with this project until he got us better pictures. Because the only pictures we had were from that 1989 video, really. If he couldn't find any of his uh, also 35 millimeter pictures, for some reason, God knows what happened to that. But unless he was, and he told us year after year after year that, oh, I'm going out this summer and I've got a crew and I've got cameras and I've got this and I've got that. Never happened. Never happened. That actually is one reason why most of the guys just kind of filtered away from the project because we didn't really believe what he was telling us. Uh, he had some other reason, I think, for not doing it. Um, what that was, who knows, that kind of died with him. But anyway, I just wanted to get the information that we do have available to us um, uh, so people can kind of see what the real situation is. Thank you so much, Dan. I don't think you're going to be spearheading a, a dive anytime soon, are you? <laughs> nope. I'm a land lover. <laughs> I'm a history, as I said in the thing. I mean, I, you know, it, it, I, 
all I want to do is research the thing. And I had such fun researching this story. I knew I would. Um, you know, the, the new modern stuff about Ed Burton, what, oh, that, I had to include that. But I, I had a lot more fun with the, with the old original historical story. I mean, the documents that are available to tell us about the people and what they did and how this all worked in the context of the political thing and the context of the indigenous relations with the indigenous people, all of that is just so sharp and refreshing. It's, uh, it was really neat. I had such fun doing this book. Well, I like to guess we'll conclude that uh, for this evening. I don't think we have any further questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to uh, terminate the recording and um, I'll be sharing this on our YouTube channel uh, in the next few days. So then we can share it to people who couldn't attend this evening. Uh, it'll be more widely available. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much.